Mate, yeah, I'm good. You're good? Yes. Bang, welcome back to the number one podcast in the world. I'm joined with the lovely Jacinta the Juggernaut Austin. That's it. There we go. Thank you for joining me today. No worries. Thanks for having me. You are an assassin by trade, paid to execute violence on whoever you choose. Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> and humble as well. Um, so you giving me a bit of a lay down. You've got 20 mm-hmm. amateur fights and then five as a pro. Yeah, 20, I think maybe like 21 or 22. Unless mm. I sat and wrote the names down, I couldn't tell you. But yeah, yeah early 20s. Yeah. Those are a lot of fights. Mm. And you're very young to have so many fights. That is crazy. Like your activity over the past, what, seven years? Seven years of fighting, yeah. That yeah. is insane. Mm. I wish there was more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a busy seven years, but um, yeah, it's slowed down a lot, obviously, in the past year or two because mm. of all the lockdowns and stuff. But yeah, we've still had I've still managed to have about yeah like two th- at least three fights a year. Yeah, that is you know to for most other sports to only compete three times a year doesn't seem like a lot because you know you got a NRL game every other weekend and and. Um, or a soccer game every other weekend. But mm. because the toll on your body in mixed martial arts in particular is so heavy, to fight three times in a year is quite a lot. Mm. I wish, to be honest, I'd do it more. Yeah. When I was like um, an amateur, I used to do like seven fights a year. <gasps> um, you obviously, did not. that's like uh, shorter rounds and, and padding and stuff. But I don't know. I loved it. I love being in fight camp and I love fighting. So it didn't feel like that much to me. But a fight camp goes for six to seven weeks Mm. and to have seven fights in a year, like you're pretty much getting out of one camp and going into the other. Yeah, pretty much. We'd fight. Sometimes I'd fight um, one weekend and then have a week off and fight two weeks later. Um, Yeah, I just took everything I could get my hands on. Are you obsessed? Probably borderline. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, borderline. (laughs) I call it a mental illness, but... (laughs) It's a mental illness that pays, so we'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) I think you have to be. I think to be successful at fighting, you have to be obsessed with it. Mm. Otherwise, it's it's insane. The things we do are insane to like everyday people. You have Mm. to be obsessed with with fighting and martial arts to give it as much as I do and and people around me do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was um, I got to watch my first um fight live last night at the urban fight night big shout out to urban they threw an amazing production um and i was sitting there in you know the third row i think and i was just like observing and like really putting myself in the shoes of what it must be like for these fighters to step into the cage you gotta i mean you would know obviously Mm. but for the people at home who don't and aren't familiar with it it's like there's there's, there's these rows of people everywhere from every angle you can imagine there's lights and Mm -hmm. there's live cameras and there's this this huge cage in the middle and to kind of imagine like myself stepping up and going into that cage Um, it was just, it felt so foreign and so scary knowing that someone else would be stepping into that cage who's just as hungry and just as, um, talented as I am. Mm. Um, it would, it'd just be horrifying. It's very overwhelming at first. I can't imagine. Yeah. It, it, um, it gets a little bit easier, but I don't think I could say that it's ever easy. It's never easy to go out there. Mm. Um, yeah, very overwhelming at first. I was saying off, off air before that. Probably the first eight fights I had, I didn't even enjoy it at all. I was, it was horrible. I hated it. And then once you can move past and channel your um, nervous energy a bit better, you start to enjoy it. But yeah. First few fights, no, nah, it's just dread. Do you have a process nowadays, like pre-fight? Mm. You know, let's say it's fight day, right? Mm. You've done your whole, you've done a successful camp. You've made weight. You're good to go. You arrive to the arena. Like, what, what's your ritual how are you preparing for once we it? get there yeah um so once we get there i don't like to so i try not to go out and see anyone i don't really like to socialize too much because i'm just so focused but for the last one uh a few weeks ago we got to the arena and i was so full like full of dread that i was ready to vomit in the car really and yeah it was horrible and i think as it's one of the biggest stages i've been on as well it was an, a next level of dread um, but what, once we actually got to the venue, 
we did a little like practice walkout. So before the crowd was allowed in, they let you like practice your walkout, go out into the ring and see the arena and move around in the ring. Mm. And as soon as I did that, I felt perfectly fine. Like it That's just like awesome. all the nerves went away and it was just excitement from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is, am I wrong in saying that this would have been the biggest fight that you've done like audience wise? Yeah. Yeah. Biggest, um, biggest venue, biggest audience. Yeah. How many yeah. people do you think were there? Well, I was the first fight. So as far as people, like the stadium wasn't full. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have actually no idea how many people I fought in front of, but I know that by the end of the now, the night, I think there was 12,000. That is fucking so insane. So there definitely wasn't that many when I fought. But um, if it's 1,000 still, yeah, which would have been more cool. obviously, yeah. but that is so much pressure and so many mm. eyeballs and you know, it's being streamed and you know, it's being mm. recorded. Yeah. So you do your practice walk out, then obviously you go back into your locker and are you like are you listening to music? Are you I do listen to a bit of music, mm. but I also just like to um I guess talk to my coaches and we have like a really relaxed vibe in the back room and we just have a bit of fun, make some jokes. Um it's very important to me that I only have like the a specific few people in the back, the people that know the right things to say and the right way to like behave in the back room. Mm. Um, what are you looking for in those with those people? I'm just looking for obviously people that have been around enough not to say anything stupid. Right. <laughs> like I've been a part of so many shows where people will come out the back and tell you how um, strong your opponent's kicks are and you've got to watch out for that head kick or you get knocked out Fuck. or – yeah, well, they'll make just like stupid comments that make you really second guess and get a little bit overwhelmed. Mm. So I'm just looking for like um, pretty much the people that I've done the whole camp with because they know exactly what I'm feeling, what my strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and, yeah, I just want to have a relaxed environment, no, like not too much pressure, talk game plan, have a laugh. Yeah. yeah, go out there feeling relaxed. Yeah, you want to yeah. go in there feeling loose and like yeah. you're just another day in the office, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want anyone to like hype it up too much. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just it's what we do in the gym every day. It's just this time it's on a stage. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a nice office you guys are working yeah. in. That is for sure. <laughs> um, why don't we pull up that fight, Sian? Yeah. Can you go to that clip? So, is this your first um, strictly boxing match? I had two amateur boxing matches. Mm-hmm. This is my first pro fight. Yeah, yeah. You look very calm. Yeah, I am. I'm very calm. I've already spent the prior like four weeks stressing out and <laughs> having meltdowns. So there, that's all out of my system. By the time all I right. get to the stage, I'm good. You're good. Yeah. You're just in your zone. Yeah. Everything's done. Weight's done. Prep's done. Uh, Sian, do you want to just cut forward a little bit to where the fight actually kicks off? I mean, that is an amazing production that they've got going on there. Yeah, very cool. It's cool because I've been to that show a few times. As a spectator? Um, as a spectator, my coach also fought on it as well. Um, and I always thought it would be pretty cool mm. to be in there as well. And here we go. Mm. So these earlier rounds are obviously very pacey for you and, you know, there's a lot of punches being thrown. Yeah. Are you, like, have you prepared for that kind of volume? Because it's very different to MMA in that sense. Yeah, I definitely have. Um, I knew, I didn't know Viviana, but I knew of her for a long time and I knew how, like, we knew how she fought. Mm. Um, she had a, quite a long amateur career as well, so we knew that she was going to have that um, busy style yeah. um, because that's how amateurs fight. They they fight with um, like points, um, so clean strike point. Um, and she's also it was she's she's quite small. The smaller ones are very quick, so you yeah. need to you need to match that so you don't get outworked as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard to counter punch someone like that who's just constantly throwing at you because. Mm. You know, you blink and there's four punches just thrown exactly. at you. Exactly, yeah. And I'd actually sparred her. Um, nice jab, by the way. Really yeah, stiff jab, though. Yeah, we worked on that a lot. Mm. Um, yeah, I'd actually sparred her maybe like three years ago. Yep. Um, but at that, when I sparred her, I was hopeless at boxing. Absolutely horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Had no hands. Um, and, yeah, she gave it to me quite a bit. She busted my nose up. 
Um, so there was a bit of dread coming into this, remembering that, and I'm sure she remembered it as well. Yeah. Which is why she was super keen to take the fight. <laughs> yeah. Um, but nah, in there, I felt fine. Yeah, I think mentally yeah. that, you know, having that um, kind of reference point to go off and mm. saying like, oh shit, like I've sparred this girl before. She's like handed it yeah. to me. Yeah. It would have acted as so much fuel for you. Yeah. It made it exciting because um, I feel like whenever you fight someone that you're a little bit intimidated by, um, you rise to their yeah, level, you rise exactly. to the occasion. Whereas if you fight someone who you don't really respect their speed or their power, mm. um, there's nothing to there's nothing to work towards. Yeah, you know? if you just if you think you're better than them, and it's it, it's a breeding ground for complacency, and yeah. it's, you know, like oh yeah, I know I could take him out on my yeah. worst day. Yeah, like obviously, my first reference point to that would be like the McGregor Poirier fight too. Mm. You know, it just felt very much so like McGregor had already looked past. Yeah, in that you can't sense. look past anyone. Once you start getting to these higher levels as well, like anyone can take it from you, so you can't look past anyone. Yeah. Round two, I think I actually was um, missing quite a bit. Hey, my range was off a little bit. Um, and then I didn't actually find my flow till round three is what I feel like. Right. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Did you go for a takedown? No, she put her head near my hips and (laughs) being, yeah, you know, (laughs) it's just the body will do what the body will do. Yeah. Yeah, you were really looking for that um, lead hook, weren't you? It's funny because we didn't actually practice that so much in camp. Um, it just came out on the night. Mm. Well, camp was full of uppercuts. Really? Yeah. Um, and then on the night, as it goes, I could, just couldn't see it. I couldn't see the uppercut. Like I tried it a couple of times and I tried to set it up, but it didn't happen. Um, and the left hook ended up being the punch that was happening. So, Did you... Um, was there a specific reason why that uppercut was selected? Like did you see the flaw in her game? Partly um, because she was you can leave quite it a bit there, shorter. Sean, um, and she has a very, when she wants to go, she has a very lunging style. Right. So she'll wait, 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 and then jump in, which is what we saw in her last pro fight. Um, so the plan was to time that jump and uh, bring the rear uppercut in as she leaped forward. Mm-hmm. But I just found on the night, every time that I tried to bait her into coming forward, she didn't come. Um, whether or not she could see what I was trying to do or she just didn't want to come at me as we thought we, she would. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it just wasn't there. Sometimes everything you practice in camp, it's not actually there on the night. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to uh, improvise at yeah. the time. Yeah. Ended up being the left hook. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, like that ability to, on the moment, just make a calculation mm. and go, okay, this um, strategy that we've kind of put forward isn't going to be exactly what we wanted, mm. but we can still work within that framework to find yeah. something else. It's a problem solving yeah. game. The strategy of um, footwork and movement went perfectly, but just that one shot we thought was going to be there all night um, wasn't there for me. But, yeah. You don't even think about, like, what – like, when you're in there, I didn't look at her and go, oh, she's open for a left hook. Your body just does it. Yeah. And then when it works, your body keeps doing it. So. But the thing is because you've instilled it into your body mm. over and over and over again, I can't imagine how many left hooks you've thrown in your yeah. lifetime, right? Yeah, exactly. It would be a ridiculous amount. Yeah. And so you, cause those neurological pathways are already there for your brain to just execute on that. Mm. And it knows the timing of it and it knows the distance that you need. Yeah. Um, so all these calculations going on, you don't even realize. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's like, cool. it's a program in the back of your brain that's just constantly going. Yeah. And that only comes with repetition. Yeah. You know, the old age quote that repetition is the mother of skill. Yeah. And so, yeah. so many rounds, so many sparring rounds, you learn to, um, yeah, your body just sees things that maybe you don't even realize that you see, but you, mm. you see it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to that third round. Yeah, let's full screen it for me. So I think this is round three, or is this a replay? Okay, no, this is it. Can we get some volume as well, please, Sion? So this is kind of where you found your mojo. Yeah, round three I started feeling relaxed. Um, I realized I didn't really have to worry about her power because even when she hit me clean, I didn't feel it. Mm. Um, she couldn't move me. I was much much stronger than her. Um, 
and yeah, it always takes me like a round or two to relax and start getting the timing right. Um, and yeah, round three is when I started finding my mojo a little bit. You've got a really nice job, like a really. Thing, she worked on it a lot. Yeah, the girl I do my sparring with has an excellent job, so right. working with her so much. And being a kickboxer, you don't actually ever really learn how to jab well, really. really? You don't work with the jab that much. So doing a boxing camp it was kind of cool getting Ooh. to learn that. Can you just lower the volume a little bit, please? Thank you. And you're very much dominating the center of the ring as well. Like you're very mm. much the aggressor in these exchanges. Always, every fight. <laughs> but I can tell that that confidence is there. Like you really. Yeah, well, uh, apart from like the actual boxing, it's one of the things that judges will look at as well is who, who has ring control. Mm, absolutely. Control. Clean for oof. Yeah, it took one. Nice oof. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta give one to take one though. Yeah. Take one, give one to take one, yeah. But you can tell by so it. This is where I loosen up. I start actually moving my torso a little mm. bit. Um, playing with the footwork. A lot of head movement, which yeah. I love to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hurt my hand quite a bit on that one. I don't know if you can even see it, I'm sort of shaking my right hand out. <laughs> yeah, I hurt my knuckles a bit. <laughs> well, it just wasn't flush, like the way you landed. Ah, uh, no, I landed it perfectly on the knuckle, but I just landed it so hard. I think that I don't even think it landed on her head. It must have landed on her. I don't know if it was that bone. punch. Yeah, was it that one? Yeah, I don't know what punch it was, but my knuckles are still sore to, this, to like. What are we? Three weeks later. <laughs> yeah, knuckles are still sore, but that's all right. Yeah. It's a very good matchup. I like you two fighting together. Yeah, she, it's a good matchup. Yeah, it's um we have a big experience gap, which is why they were so confident in their win. Um, but I have a better team and I have better coaching. So. Yeah, I guess people don't realize that they're like MMA is such a team sport and it relies yeah. so heavily on your coaches and your physios yeah. and you know your sparring partners, obviously. Mm -hmm. So what's going through your head this last round? Um, so, so I always ask my coaches um, where I'm at in the fight. I always like to know if I'm winning or losing because um, that'll that'll change the way I fight the last round. Oh, there was that uppercut you were looking for. Yeah, I was looking for it. Whether or not it landed properly, we don't know. I don't know. Um, but all I know is that I was probably ahead, mm -hmm. but you just never know. Yeah. You never know what the judges are looking for. Um, so, and, I, and, and my corner said it to me at, at the time in the break, um, you just need to, you need to work hard and you need to put power in because that's what they're going to score as well is the clean power strikes. Yeah. Yeah. So. So you didn't necessarily go in looking for a knockout or looking for a specific. No, I never, I have looked for a lockout, knockout once and it turned my striking to garbage. Like right. if you, when you go looking for it, um, no, I never look for it. Yeah. No. Just throw as cleanly as possible. Throw, yeah. Just try and land clean and, and try to... You've got excellent footwork for the fourth <laughs> round, considering that most people would have been absolutely exhausted by now. Oh, yeah. Your footwork is exceptional. Well, we need so much footwork for MMA. That's what boxers don't realise, is we need... We can't rely on a double guard to get us out of trouble. We have to move because those little gloves will get through the double guard. They'll yeah. get around it, they'll get under it. Um, and people are always trying to take you down at the legs, so you need to be moving your feet all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, simple head movement and double guard just won't, no, just won't cover you. You need to use your, like, your feet to get away. So, yeah. I think because I hadn't done any pro boxing, um, they had no idea besides that Ooh, one spar. Nice left, right hand <laughs> there. Yeah. There's a lot of fun. 
So did you walk away from that saying like, okay, I know what the result is or were you still feeling very uncertain? Oh, I was confident I won. Mm -hmm. Like I was confident that I hit her more than she hit me yep. and with more power. But you just never know with judges. Yeah. You never know. Like um, we went to a fight night last week and it was actually my coach. And I swear he dominated every single round. He got the win. But one of the judges scored at 38-38, so two rounds apiece. But he, I, it was just so weird. Like you never know what some judges are seeing or what they're scoring. So you can never be... <laughs> Never be a hundred percent what they're gonna say. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so weird the scorecards. I've seen some like horrible decisions, yeah. you know. Or one judge will give it like something completely opposite to the other judge and you're like, How yeah. does this work? Yeah. You're both obviously seeing two different things. Mm. So And you know, yeah. you don't know if one judge like has a preference, like in MMA in specific mm. it's alright, you can cut the video now, Sean, thank you. Um, you don't know if one um Judge has a preference over ground game, mm. or if another one has a preference over striking. Yeah, or volume over power, or yeah, it's so subjective. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I have like hour long debates with my friends mm -hmm. as to you know, we'll watch a fight together and we'll just be going back and forth. No, but did you see the way he got that guillotine? Yeah, but he's escape and he's yeah. Do you it. score the attempt or the escape? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. So, yeah, we were confident. My uh, coaches both told me that I won after the bell went and, I don't know, we're touching gloves or something. They both told me I won. So if they told me I won, I'm pretty confident I won because mm -hmm. they're very, they're not very biased. Like They're honest with you? Yeah, they're very honest, even inspiring and everything. If I don't do well, they're very honest. And even after the first round, I asked them if I won the first round because I like to know. Um, and they both said, oh, like, I'm not sure. Like, you're just going to have to do more because I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. So, yeah, they're real. They're very real with me. So if they told me I won, then I'm pretty confident that I won. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. So. Are, you, are you looking to get into another boxing exchange anytime soon or do you want to uh, no focus? i'm not i'm not looking for it mm -hmm. um just as i wasn't looking for this one it found me <laughs> yeah um i want to get back into the cage get back into mma early next year um mma is my my main goal it's, it's your bread my, and butter yeah i always say uh, mma is my wife and mm -hmm. um boxing keep boxing like my side your side chicks yeah, my side chicks yeah. nice yeah nice. so but if something comes up and i'm not doing anything at the time and it's a good show a good opponent why not yeah absolutely yeah, yeah why it was not? a lot of fun i loved it so why mma where how did that career start because it is a very <clears throat> um unique career path mm. they don't really offer that at school no. <laughs> <laughs> they don't offer it at home either <laughs> um well, MMA, I only started last year. Well, I only started fighting this year. I only mm -hmm. started training last year. Um, so my my bread and butter was kickboxing. I was a kickboxer that also did Muay Thai as well. Um, but to be honest, there's no opportunity in Australia for kickboxers, especially female kickboxers. There's just no scene for it. There's Why no do you money. think that is? Um, I just think it's not a it's not a, a fan sport as much as boxing and MMA is. Um, there's no... There's no career path really, unless you go to one championship or something like that. But even getting there is such a it's such a mission. There's no opportunity. I went on like I think I went on a win streak of fourteen fights. Wow. And got nowhere. Like you know fourteen strike win streak. Yeah. In any Do other that competition. In MMA, you're, you know, well, you're, you're at the top of the world. Yeah. 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 I mean, granted they were amateur fights, but still you, you I didn't get half the um uh, I just I didn't get where I thought I was gonna go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and then which is strange to me because it's such an entertaining sport. It is the pace is insane. Yeah, yeah, and it's brutal. Like mm. kicks, leg kicks, body kicks. It's everything you love about MMA. Yeah, com condensed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I thought it was so entertaining. I always thought I'd end up in glory kickboxing or mm. one championship, um, but it just wasn't happening for me. And you don't get any younger either, mm. so. Um, I moved moved gyms. Um, that's when I came over to Karaoke MMA. Mm -hmm. um, started learning how to grapple. Realized I was in love with grappling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, fighters um, tend to have a very either love it or hate it relationship with yeah. grappling. Yeah. If really you hate it though, I don't think you're going to be very good at mixed martial arts. Mm. Yeah. I think I you've got to love all of it. I don't understand it. it I, I don't understand how you can not love it. Mm. You know, like I've been 
maybe training jujitsu for a month now yeah. and i'm like i'm obsessed with it yeah. like i want to know every move and where it came from and i want to yeah. know everything about the gracies and the, all of them mm. you know and yeah i'll talk to some fighters and they go oh no i don't want anything to do with jiu-jitsu it's normally down. strikers that hate it as well because yeah. they're so used of their own element and their own comfort zone that grappling is very overwhelming mm-hmm. which it was for me as well um but once you get past that stage and you get like a little bit of competency. It's so much fun. Mm. It's, it's awesome. Um, so now I don't think I could ever be just a kickboxer because I like grappling too much. Yeah. Yeah. Same story of boxing. Could not never be just a boxer because I love grappling. Couldn't be a grappler because I love boxing. Yeah. You know? I love all of it. And once um, you've got all those elements kind of in play mm. working succinctly, you get like a really, you yeah. know, highly seasoned fighter that can take on anyone. Yeah. So I want to be... I don't want anyone to look at me and pick out one singular discipline that's a weakness. I want to be um, solid in absolutely everything, and I love training all of it, so I think that's bound to happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So did you always – because you said you started at – was it 20, did you say? started training around 19. 19. Fighting at 20, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Prior to that – no martial arts. No martial arts. <clears throat> no. Always athletic, always doing sport. What kind of sport? Um, I did a little athletics a lot. Okay. Just that sort of stuff. Like um, sprinting, high jump. I was more distance. of a, like a long distance, okay. like a, a runner. So you've um, got a gas tank. Yeah, I forget. A very, yeah, I have a natural, yeah, natural gas tank. Um, and other than that, I actually did equestrian, if you want to count that <laughs> as a sport. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did that for like... Eight years, maybe. How does one get into equestrianism? <laughs> it's just called equestrian. How does um, one become an equestrian? Well, I just, when I was young, like, I think I started around maybe like 11, 11 ish. Mm. Um, I just liked horses. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, that's, that's the sport I chose. We got to choose one sport. What? You just had a horse? Oh, no, we had, like, well, I I was living in Penrith, which is not far from, like, Cranebrook, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of land out there um, and a lot of, like, I don't even know what the word is anymore, equestrian places. <laughs> <laughs> um, equestrian centres? Yes. I think I've seen, I've seen <laughs> yeah. that on a sign somewhere. Yeah, 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 and that's that's what I chose, so that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. Did some competitions and There's stuff. There's always that one horse girl that's cool. Exactly. I was the horse girl and I like <laughs> never live it down to this day because I still have the same friends from when I was in school. Oh, right. So I'm still the horse girl. Yeah. Yeah. Still a weird horse girl. Still the horse girl that can kick up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but other than that, um, no martial arts. No. 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 Because your ascent was very quick in that sense. Like considering everything that you have done in your career so far – you know, wins, losses, and everything in between. Mm. You, you've done a lot in seven years. I've done a lot, but also, like, to me, I haven't done enough. So that's where my mindset is at, that I need to do more. Um, and that doesn't mean so much as, like, volume or more fights or more training. I just um, where, c- compared to where I see myself going, um, where I'm at now is – it's not quite good enough. <laughs> but do you see that from a fighting, um, like a perspective of fighting, like your fighting is enough to scratch or do you think it's career path, like where you are right now as opposed to where you want to be in your career? I think where my um, technical ability is at at the moment matches where my career is at. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't think that I'm entitled to anything that I don't currently have, but I think I'm getting to the point where I'm getting good enough that um, – I, I think I belong on a bigger stage now. Right. I think I've done so many years of um, the apprenticeship, my, my coach used to call it. Yeah. Where you have to learn all your hard lessons and and fight all the like fights that maybe aren't perfect for you, but you're going to learn from each of them. And I feel like I've come to the end of that now and I just feel like I'm in the next maybe year or two is when I need to um, – get more from the sport than I have. Mm-hmm. I feel like yeah, I definitely belong on a bigger stage. And so how do you approach that? Um, well, I see out my contract next year with Eternal MMA mm-hmm. and obviously in my head I d- ideally win all those fights. Um, how many fights do you have left with that contract? It's a three-fight contract. It's a three-fight contract? Yeah. So obviously that slowed down because of COVID. 
Yeah, well, I only just signed with them like a couple months ago. Oh, right. Yeah. This is recent. Yeah, this okay. is recent. Yeah. So that's a good, um, it's a good stepping stone. It's a good, it's a good, um, it's a good win. Mm-hmm. Um, so see those out. And then from there, like, um, I've been fighting on the Australian scene for so long. I feel like it's time to move up. Um, and to be honest, there's no one even really for me to fight here um, in my weight division. Um, so it's time to move on, I think, after next year. Is it difficult finding opponents? Very, very yeah. difficult. Yeah. So for my last MMA fight, I ended up moving up uh, five kilos. Really? Just to have someone to fight. Yep. Um, I came in well under. That like, is a very big, undersized. That is a big jump up. Big jump. That's why I hear all these boxers complain about having to move up a weight division, which is two and a half kilos in boxing. Yeah, no, it's nothing. No. Um, so we moved up one division, which was five kilos for MMA. Um, and I was so undersized for that fight and she was so oversized, very overweight. Um, but that's, that's what we had to do to get a fight. Otherwise there's no fight for you. I don't think people really appreciate how big of a jump that is. Mm. Like five kilos in a fight. In a fight that has grappling. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of weight. Yep. How did you navigate that? Like, how did you take on that challenge knowing that mm. you were going, not only were you going up five kilos into the next weight class, but then there was someone else that was probably very comfortable in that weight class. And did you say Well, she actually missed weight. So she, she was missed too big. Weight. She was too big for the weight class <gasps> anyway. Oh my so really, God, so really like it was two kilo, uh, sorry, two weight classes. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't easy. I um, had to. First, like at first, I was really trying to avoid being grabbed or grappled in any in any way because I just thought her like strength and power. Uh, I didn't know if I'd be able to get back up from it. Um, turns out I did, and I actually out grappled her entirely. But it definitely plays a big part in the game plan. Um, you've got to work around someone rather than working to your own strength. Um, yeah, and it was it was hard in there. It was so hard to move like off the cage. I'm surprised you yeah. say it was the grappling that concerned you. I thought it would have been more the striking. No. No? No. No. She, um, to be honest, she didn't really hit very hard. But also um, I've always, I've done a lot of kickboxing fights in up at that division too. Mm-hmm. So I'm sort of used to feeling the power of those girls anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, it was more the grapple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The wrestling. And so how did that fight go? I won. Yeah. Um, yeah, I ended up, like, the game plan was to go in there and strike her. But just like I was saying before, like, I didn't see, um, it wasn't working for me as well as I wanted it to. She just kept forcing the grapple. She was so persistent with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the first break, I think, my coach was just like, just fuck it. Like, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, you're okay. You can <laughs> okay. swear. It's all good. Um, he's like, just go for it. Like, you can grapple too. You're yeah. not just a kickboxer anymore. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I ended up taking her down and just running with it and I had the better grappling on the night. So I slapped on a couple of sub attempts, didn't get them, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, being a defensive grappler is hard, but if you're being offensive and you're controlling where the grapple is, not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're dictating the momentum of the fight. And so for as long as you're... Mm in control of that situation, you you can find the leverage points in your body that are going to work towards your favor. Mm. You know, a lot less exhausting being on top as well yeah, than bottom. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Of course. And you've got that natural gas tank. Yeah. And it was a bit of fun, like, because my first Prem and May fight, I did, um, we, we didn't grapple in the fight. Stay away from the grapple entirely. Do not engage in it. Mm. Um, so the second fight, it was cool to get to play around in that area a little bit. Yeah. Because I hadn't done it in a fight before. So it's like valuable, valuable cage time. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So we kind of directed a bit off the question, but so how do you, oh, go, how do you, no, no, <laughs> that's okay. Um, how do you go about finding your opponents now other than jumping up five, 10 kilos? Uh, well, that's what my um, new management, Phoenix management mm-hmm. is going to be taking care of now. So I don't really have to think about that. Okay, um, sweet. I'll take care of it. I do have an opponent that I was supposed to fight before um COVID. So hopefully I'll still be fighting her. She's from New Zealand. Mm-hmm. What's her name? Um her name is Nyrene Crowley. Nyrene Crowley. City kickboxing. What do we know about her? Um she's had I think six or seven pro MMA fights. Um she spent some time in one championship. Oh wow. So she's at a pretty high level. Um solid really solid kickboxing. 
good grappling. Yeah, she's just good and she's going to be one of those people, like I was saying before, that makes me rise to the occasion. I'm going to have to step it up, yeah. which I like. Yeah. yeah. I want to fight people that are, are considered better and more experienced than myself. And to if, let's say, best case scenario, you beat this um, lady and you get the win, you know, it puts so many more eyeballs on you. Yeah. Just the fact that she's been in one championship and just mm-hmm. the fact that she's had that exposure. Like, I'm sure there'll be people watching very eagerly to see what happens. There. Yeah. Even the camp she comes from, like City Kickboxing, like my coach is obsessed with their camp because, you know, they're City Kickboxing, they're all over the UFC. Um, So they definitely know what they're doing. They definitely know what they're teaching over there. So to beat someone from such a strong camp, um, it's, it's going to be a good opportunity for me to show, like, how strong our camp is too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Represent with pride, right? Yeah. That's I'm excited. awesome. Yeah. So hopefully that hopefully that happens. Yeah. And um I think as well, like as you are kind of entering to this new phase of your career where um you know, you have a, a lot of the next kind of steps are going to rely very heavily on your public image and your public profile and, you know, being able to just draw more eyeballs because eventually that's that's essentially what these promoters really care about at the end of the day. How many bums can you put on chairs? Mm-hmm. Is is having like a management agency in that sense like really helping you, do you think? Um. Yeah, definitely. Well, they're the ones that have got me the fights. Mm-hmm. So every fight gets you exposure and they got me the fights. So... Yeah. yeah, and they put a lot of effort. Um, they've signed a lot of um, Sydney athletes lately. They've put a lot of effort into promoting those athletes as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, we're definitely on the right path. Yeah, and I think yeah. in your case, it allows you just to have more time to focus on your craft. Mm. You know, yeah, because the whole social media landscape is a game in itself. You know, where some people become very good kickboxers or jiu-jitsu artists. Some people just get very good at Instagram or very good at Facebook or very good at YouTube or TikTok or whatever the platform. Mm. Um, and so I think for as, the least amount of time you have to, you need to focus on that aspect of the game and the more you can focus on your own craft and just bettering that and sharpening that blade over and over again, it's only going to play into your favor. Yeah. Because you've... You've got the results of someone else taking care of, you know, promoting you and getting you fights and helping mm. you build that public image. Um, and whereas you're just, you know. Yeah. I think all that stuff, um, I know, like, it's very important. Everyone's very big on it. But I think all of it comes. It comes when it comes. Like, it comes in its own time. You don't force it. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I don't need to do more than keep going out there and winning and it'll come. You yeah. Know? That's um, true. We don't need to force things before their time, I think. You trust the process? Trust the process and, yeah. and things will happen when, when, when the time's right, I think. That's not very common amongst fighters though. No, it's not. And it hasn't been in my case for like a lot of years. Um, just recently, I don't know. There's definitely been a change in the trajectory of my career in the past year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can like feel that and I can feel it's moving in the right direction and – I like look back with a lot of hindsight now at all the little things that have happened to get me to where I am now and it all just makes sense. So if you just keep like performing, I think everything else comes with it. Yeah. All the sponsors will come, the social media will come, the everything will come if you just the most important thing is to perform. Perform right. first. Yeah. Yeah, there's something undeniable about greatness. Like someone can talk a big game and someone can Get a lot of eyeballs on yeah. them. Yeah. How many social media fighters do we all know? Yeah. <laughs> many. Exactly. Yeah. But um, at the end of the day, I mean, look, case in point, um, I don't know how you feel about the guy, but Dylan Dennis, right? Do you know him? He's Conor McGregor's training partner in jiu-jitsu. Right. And he is, like, notorious for just being on every single – Instagram page that has a million a million followers or mm. more, and he's just always the first comment there. He's always engaging in that kind of stuff. He's always mm. talking trash online. But the guy hasn't fought in like three years. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, like fighters even in New South Wales that are like that. You think so? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You never fight, bro. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, fight first, and then you know, yeah. then talk about it. 
Mm. Yeah, there there has like there has to be balance between the two because every let's be real, everyone loves trash talk. Yeah, everyone loves to see it. You know, you, when whenever you see a fighter like throw a water bottle across the stage or call mm. someone out, it's there's just a natural response to kind of engage with it. And yeah, go, oh, what's going on? Yeah. I'm all for the call out. I support the call out. I called out my first opponent. And that's how I got the fight. Yeah, yeah, respectfully, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just all the people that. I just think people get too caught up on all that other, like the social media side and the publicity and the, when they should just be focusing on the training and the winning. Mm. And when you win, everything else will come. Yeah. Yeah. Wise words. (laughs) Wise words. (laughs) Older and a little bit wiser. (laughs) Not entirely wise, but (laughs) working on it. No, it's, it's, you know, it's a very healthy perspective to have. You know, I'm I'm coming up from the angle of someone who's very engaged on that other side. Yeah, it's part of your job as well to be, mm. yeah, engaged. Um, that. so yeah, but I think you're absolutely right. Like at the end of the day, privacy, pri- the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, you know, and so if you can just show a 15 um, fight streak where you're unbeaten, or mm. you know, you've maybe had one decision not go in your favor, like that's just undeniable. Yeah, the pens on the paper, it's there. Mm. You know. Whereas, sure, you can get the million clicks, but... Yeah. But Depends what your priority is, I think. Mm. Yeah. Who do you who do you look up to? Like, who do you <clears throat> kind of model from? Or do you model um, from anyone? As far as, like, fighting? Mm. Or... Um... Hmm. I always, like, look up to, the like, the obvious choices. Like, Rose, Rose Namunis is my favourite fighter in the UFC. I think she... Like, not just her fighting, but everything she stands for as well. Um, I really like her. If if I wanted to be like anyone, it'd be like her. Yeah. Um, but then also, ideally, at the same time, I'd really like just want to fight her one day. Like, that's <laughs> that's my goal is one day is to reach that level. Right? Yeah. Um, to the point where your rivals become, your idols become your rivals. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That would be the end goal is your favorite fighter is the one that's standing across from you, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but n- not not so much. Like I love a lot of fighters, um, mm. but I just kind of I get a lot of inspiration from the like the team I have around me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, most of my inspiration comes from um, like thinking about how far I can go if I just stay focused as well. Um, because like even though the process has taken like a bit longer than maybe I thought it would. Um, I think that's gonna that's gonna be a good thing, and I'm slowly like learning little hard lessons that I needed to learn along the road. Um, and yeah, just hindsight like isn't is everything for me. Like yeah. I look back at all the like good times and bad times and realize how they've all led me to where I am now. Um, and yeah, I just yeah inspired by where I could be one day. Mm. Yeah, it's cool stuff. Do you do you consider yourself disciplined? very with most things yeah (laughs) yeah yeah in yeah with training yeah Mm. yeah very um training diet um general lifestyle what's your diet look like what are you what are you fueling yourself with um well i did just come from a christmas party where we had pizza but (laughs) it's christmas so that's okay i won't tell anyone (laughs) yeah um but for the most part like i have a dietitian i work with the fight dietitian Mm. Yeah, um, he does like everyone, um, pretty much every. Like, I think they've probably got like seventy percent of fighters at the moment. They do oh, wow. all, all the nutrition. They're amazing. Who um, who are they? What are their name? They're the fight dietitian. Is oh, the fight called. dietitian. Yeah, name. right. Uh, okay. Jordan Sullivan owns it. Um, right. He does a lot of the UFC guys. Um, and so he'll they'll do like my weight cut for me, but they also give me stuff that. Um, I should be like just more like measurements of what I should be reaching each day because I do a lot of training. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably like a chronic overtrainer. Really? Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. In fight camp, like I don't think I overtrain. I think I do a right, the right amount. But out of fight camp, um, I, I train a lot, like four or five hours a day. Really? Yeah. Um, partly because i'm when so are you, when are you training how are you how are you sustaining four or five hours a day every day um well i did just move to part-time work right this year um because i got like a lot of sponsors come on board mm-hmm. which are supporting me in my endeavor congratulations thank you <laughs> um so i work part-time so that's why i have the time to train that much yeah um 
but like I'm like I'm doing MMA. There's so much to learn. Um, I'm sort of late to the party as like if you compare me to other girls my age. So I have so much catching up to do. Mm. Um, so every day I'm I'm boxing. Every day I'm doing jujitsu or wrestling. Are you involved in a lot of sparring? Um, I don't spar that much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have heard of the fighters say that as well. Like yeah. They're not too interested in the sparring side of training. As far as hard sparring, I'll do that like once a week in fight camp. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of fight camp, I don't really hard spar. I'll just do like technical spars, light mm-hmm. spars a couple of times a week. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I remember seeing clips of these um kids in Thailand and – the, the way they would train was so interesting. Mind you, these mm. are like six and seven year olds. Yeah, they're born into it. They're born into it, and yeah. they—it's almost like they're playing with each other. It's mm. almost like slap boxing like a in a sense. Yeah. yeah, and they're not going for like knockouts or heavy punches mm. or whatever. It's just very much about getting that timing and that distance yeah, and having and that a control. play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really training the fight like a game. Mm. Yeah, we do a lot of that. I did that like I think three times this week. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a fun way to like like spa without taking the damage mm-hmm. and you can experiment, play, see what works, see what doesn't work. Um yeah. I just I don't know, I just love it. It's maybe not the best thing, but I don't really have any hobbies outside of fighting. Right. Um just because fighting has taken so much time from me. Yeah. But yeah, I just there's so much I want to learn. I wish that I had like uh, enough lifespan to go all the way into the depths of gi jiu-jitsu and yeah. no gi jiu-jitsu and boxing and muay thai and kickboxing and wrestling <laughs> <laughs> yeah like there's only so many hours in one day but and the thing is right like there is so much that is still being developed mm. currently yeah you know like you've got the upper hand in the sense that you're coming from the perspective of someone who's um coming into the sport when UFC is, or MMA rather is very much so at its mm. peak you know it's had like its founding fathers it's had people like really come in and bring it to the public light and now it's this new generation of people coming forward and saying okay I like what you did there what can I add to it mm. what can and yeah. then there's a generation behind you that's already taking on board all the stuff that you're doing and then adding their own spins to it. So, you know, there's mm. quite, especially it's always evolving, especially in sports like jujitsu, it's always evolving, mm. always evolving. There's always new stuff going on. Yeah. That's what's exciting about it though. I think is that you're never going to, um, you're never going to know all of it. Yeah. Ever. Really? Ever. <laughs> yeah. It's like an overwhelming thought and a cool thought mm. that everything, like you're trying to learn everything, but you'll never actually know everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when you can um, like smell out a bullshit fighter. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, no, I know everything about nah. jiu-jitsu. It's like, what? Lies. <laughs> Lies. What do you mean you know everything? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's cool. Makes you into a humble person having, like, when you train so many disciplines as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, fighting is very humbling. Mm. There's nothing more humbling than, you know, getting choked out or literally having someone just, like, catch you in an arm bar and yep. squeeze and pull your body. And it's body. every night, like... It's every night you're being taught the lesson the hard way. So, yep, there's no room for ego. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And, you know, like I noticed in a lot of fighters, they have a very calm and um, relaxed presence about them. You know, they're not antsy. They're not looking for problems. It, mm. It's very calm. And I think that's because – when you're so exposed to violence on a continuous basis, <laughs> you don't look for conflict anywhere else no. in life. Like, you're just honestly exhausted from the training all the time. Right? Yeah. But it's true. And I think that's a lot of the problem with what we're seeing, like, you know, around in the world right now where everyone feels very tense and stressed out and, you know, obviously coming out of a pandemic and then it's it feels like, everyone's kind of got this jarriness about them. Mm -hmm. There's this real tension in the air. Mm -hmm. Um, But because people are just constantly in these like little microchasms of conflict. But when you have the ability to take that conflict out and insert it physically into something like boxing or jujitsu or kickboxing Mm -hmm. or wrestling or, you know, name the discipline. Yeah. It, it, takes away the need for that conflict it's really interesting the effect that mma actually has on psychology yeah i i think that's that's right because i started to feel like that in lockdown i started to feel very like uptight and 
on edge and fidgety and easily irritated. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, because of the lack of, well, I was still training a little bit, but nowhere near as much. Yeah. Think, what were you able to do during lockdown? Um, well, you could still do one-on-ones. So mm. I was still working with my coach a lot. Um, it was actually pretty good fixing a lot of holes I had in my game. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a lot of, it was actually cool. We were doing a lot of boxing just because... And then the fight came, the boxing fight came yeah. up and we'd, we'd been doing like so much boxing in lockdown. So that was cool. Um, anyway, that's why I think uh, martial arts is something that should be um, implemented maybe in schools or mm. I don't know, for like, especially for teenagers who are so full of angst and energy and a lot of the time they're full of hate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think martial arts would is... I don't know. We just need to have something in schools. I yeah. don't know if it would. I don't know if jujitsu would work, but if you don't think boxing, so. I don't know. I don't know. I have I no idea. I think out of all the disciplines, I think jujitsu would be the best one. Yeah, but I just think kids are real. Like at that teenage age, they're real weird with touching each other. Right. Like especially yeah. like you'd have to do like maybe girls. Yeah, and guys class. Yeah, and girls I class. just remember being at that age and being like, I don't want to touch anyone. <laughs> yeah. Um. So even box something something to get like all their teenage angst out. Yeah. yeah, it's so important and it's so underrated. It's yeah. so underrated, you know, because growing up, um, we're very much so pushed like rugby and soccer and, mm. you know, or cross country or athletics. Um, and there's nothing wrong with any of those sports. Like they're all, at the end of the day, they all give you that dopamine hit yeah. of doing something challenging. Mm-hmm. But I just think none of those sports are going to give you that same impact and that same long-term effect that mma is gonna have yeah i agree yeah 100 yeah, percent. because again it's just doing something where you're like literally on the brink of death you know and obviously you don't want to take 16 year olds there you want to make sure it's safe and, mm. um but there's like that kind of realization you know when you someone forces you to tap out you're yeah. like fuck like at any point in time if they wanted to keep going mm. they totally could have yeah but it's like, a lot of discipline you get they'll learn how to defend themselves safely. They'll learn to live like I think they'll learn to live more disciplined lifestyles, mm. which a lot of young people could use. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just that's I'd I'd like to see that one day. I Do hope th- that by the time I have teenage kids, martial arts is a thing in school. Are you gonna get them into martial arts? Um, yeah. Yeah. If they don't like it, they don't like it, but they'll at least try it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. I think it's a good foundation. I mean, even just like purely for a self defense perspective, yeah. right? If they don't want to, um, if they never wanted to compete, no worries. Yeah. But, you know, you're going to try it. <laughs> you're going to try once. <laughs> you're going to respect what yeah. I did. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to know. <laughs> yeah. That's a long way off though, but yeah. Yeah. I just think it's um such a life-changing thing, martial arts, and you don't know that until you try it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There's nothing like it. There's really nothing mm. like it. Do you, Have you felt the um the... Because you did say before that you felt like disciplined, especially like within the space of martial arts. Do mm-hmm. you feel like that discipline is kind of like transcended outside of <clears throat> the sport as well, or are you kind of a bit more relaxed and no, hundred percent, yeah. Um, just yeah, the lifestyle I live now is very it's very healthy, like physically and mentally, for the most part. But you've always been to sports. You've always been to always been into sport, but like going back to like. Teenagers and stuff, we're all a mess at like 16, 17, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, there's only like, I don't know, there's like only a couple of decisions you make in life that will change the trajectory of your life and we're all out there causing trouble when we're young. Mm. Um, so even like when I see the kids class at my gym or the teens class, I'm like, this is so cool that these kids are in here like really interested in learning martial arts rather than being out causing trouble. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just, just the healthy lifestyles. Like I make sure that I eat properly. I make sure that I sleep properly I make sure I'm not out all night. Um, yeah, it's just a healthier existence than, that I have if, than if I didn't have martial arts, hundred percent. Um, and what you're saying before is very true. Like I know in New York in particular, like boxing gyms are used literally to take pick kids that would rather be on the street causing trouble and mm. giving them an outlet to do that. Yeah. It, it takes people, firstly, to step into a ring, you have to be, like, there has to be a couple screws <laughs> just <loose> missing. Screws. <laughs> there has to be, right? Yeah. 
it definitely takes something something extra and i think um mma again then takes something extra on top of that like to have to be like either way to be on the ground held down getting hit in the face and then choked out and then vice versa to be holding someone down mm. hitting them in the face trying to choke them out it's definitely yeah only a few people that want and that. there's no cookie cutter you know response to it either mm. you know like i was recently i was talking to amanda allen who was um a crossfit world champion for three um she's won the world she's won the crossfit world championship three times um and it always been very very active always participated in like triathlons and um you know, rowing competitions and mm. always been very, very fit, but fell into alcoholism at a very young age, mm. you know, and it it just goes to show that, like, for some people, even if you do have that physical discipline and that physical, you know, desire to be great, there's also that, like, internal relationship that you have to take care of as well. And she speaks about that quite openly. And, yeah. You know, how do, how do you train your kind of mindset? to stay so focused and so disciplined because it's one thing to rock up to training and do mm. what you have to do but there's still 20 hours left in the day yeah. where you could go and fuck it up yeah well i think those 20 hours in the day are going to affect how your next training session goes as well yeah what you do in those those hours off is going to affect how you perform in the hours on so if you're up all night you're mm -hmm. not going to spar well the next day if you're out like I'm not saying I don't drink or I don't go out or anything like that. Um, I do, but um, especially being Christmas. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part during the year, um, it's gotten to the point. I've been doing this long enough now, where it's gotten to the point where ninety percent of my decisions I make outside of the gym are to if, are to um, make myself better in the gym. Right. Yeah. So whether it's friendships, relationships, work. Yeah. I was telling How you. do you maintain a social life while being a fighter? <laughs> it can't be easy. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of like a quality over quantity person. I don't mm. have like uh, like that many different people that I socialize with. I have a few like good ones. Like I was saying, I have the same friends from when I was in school. Mm. Um, so Which I is very, them. like, not common, especially yeah. in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so we've known each other for, like, over 20 years. Um, but actually the gym is it's a big social side as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's huge. Like, every night, four hours a night with pretty much the same people, you're going to become friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you're, or you're really going to hate, hate each them. other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, there's one guy at the yeah. gym who's got a mean hook. Oh, mean there's, there's a few of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Outside of camp, I'm a bit more social. I like to go out and stuff. Yeah. Um, but because I think because my friends have been around for so long, um, they know when I'm fighting, you're not going to see me. Yeah. So for those seven weeks, no, I'm not coming. Don't invite me. <laughs> yeah. They respect yeah, the boundaries. I'm just so tunnel visioned that I can't almost can't can't do it. Mm. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think fighting, like especially if you want to get to the highest level, it takes a lot a lot from you, and sometimes. Social life is one of those things. How did your parents respond? And you said, hey, I'm going to be, mum, I got my first, um, <laughs> <laughs> my first fight coming this week. Mm. Come watch. Ah, uh, no, they don't like it. Yeah. No. Still to this day? Still to this day. Really? Yep. Um, that's okay. I mean, no one wants to watch their kid get in a cage and get hit, right? Mm. But um, it's not their cup of tea, but that's all right. I was going to do it whether or not it was their cup of tea. So mm. <laughs> It's a hard yeah. thing to come over though. Yeah. Um, I think you get used to it and you um, learn to find, I guess, um, reassurance from other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, like I'm not doing it for anyone besides me. So whether or not people like it, don't really care. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you learn to, like, let go of the opinions that that don't support you, I guess. Yeah. You're very, very focused. <laughs> you're very – you've got a very good head on your shoulder. Oh, like, Jesus. You. Yeah. That's – because, you know, you hear those um, <clears throat> complications all the time, like, oh, my friends weren't, you know, supportive mm. and they kept trying to distract me or my parents weren't supportive and, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't find training partners or I couldn't find um, – 
you know, I couldn't find a good gym or mm. no one wants to fight me or I have to go. Like, you know, for yeah. a lot of people, these would be kind of hurdles that stop them along the way. Yeah, they, you know? I think so. I think they but, are hurdles. I'm not saying I've never, like, had a problem with any of it. Mm. Um, but I'm at the point now where I've, um, I guess, unpacked all that and moved on from it. Like, you address it at the time and maybe it bothers you at the time. Um, but... I guess when your priority is so high, like as mine is, um, you find ways to work around it and yeah. So I'm assuming there's no plan B for you. Like it's um, all chips on black. As far as like sport, like no. Yeah. Um, I, I'm i actually happy that I've managed to maintain my um, – because the initial plan was I was going to entirely resign from my job. Um, and you just go all in with fighting. What were you doing outside of fighting? Sorry. Uh, I do bathroom designs. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm an account manager. So um, it's like it's a cool job. I like it. Yeah. Um, it's got a lot of perks, but I think you have like your whole life to do that sort of stuff really. Yeah, I'm absolutely. doing that sort of stuff when I'm 40, 50, um, where you only have a, a window with, with MMA. There's something about the freedom in your 20s where you can really go and take those chances yeah. and take those risks. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. You can't do it uh, when you're 40, really. Yeah, mortgage, two yeah. kids, people Body's falling on. out. <laughs> yeah. So now's the time. So, But anyway, they were um, supportive enough to keep me on part-time and sponsor me through. Um, oh, really? Fighting. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's worked out perfectly. So it's not like I'm an unemployed bum that just, you know, lives off cage fights. Which we, it's kind of funny to say that out loud, but the reality is there are people like yeah. living like that. You know? Yeah, like I never wanted to be that. I never wanted to struggle. Like I want, never wanted the, the sport to make me struggle. Mm. Um. I mean, physically, yes, it makes you struggle. <laughs> financially. But, yeah, financially. Yeah. I never wanted, wanted to struggle because um, it kind of sheds like a dim light on the sport, I think. Yeah, it yeah. turns it into a burden almost. Yeah, yeah. Like, look at all this money I could be making if it wasn't this yeah. stupid career I want to go yeah. for. Yeah, and no. like so many promotions I turned down, so many opportunities like where I could be making a lot more money. Um, but I can do that later. Yeah. 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 So I mean, you know, you've got to be fueled by the right reasons. Like you kind of said before, if you trust the process and mm. trust that the money will come when the money will come. Yeah. You know, like you just you just got to trust the process. It's yeah. almost like blind faith in yourself. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's very admirable about you. Is like you've really taken a chance on yourself. Mm. You've really doubled down and said, no, I can do this. Yeah. Well, we won't know until we try, right? Mm. Like I say I'm going to achieve all these things, but I won't actually know until I've done it. So, um, yeah. You you can't die wondering is the point I'm making, I Do you guess. have doubts? Yes, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, all the time. Um, like I don't have doubts about what I want, like I know what I want. Mm. Um, I have doubts about whether I'll get there because I'm sure there's been a lot of people in my situation that think they're going to, you know, make it to the top and they don't for whatever reason financially, relationships, gyms, whatever. Um, but if I stop now, then I'll never know if I could have done it. Yeah. So I need to know. Yeah. So we're going to yeah. find out. And it's almost like <laughs> a double-edged blade, right? It's like the closer you get to where you want to be, yeah. the more like intense those doubts become. Yeah. Right? Because so if, if you're they just, mean more. Yeah. Every, everything starts meaning more as you get, um, I guess, higher up. As an amateur, if you just like take a year and let's say you lose two fights and you go, oh, that's it, but mm. I gave it a shot, whatever, it doesn't matter that much. But then if you're a seasoned pro that's trying to get into something like Bellator and, mm. you know, you're right there and then you tear your ACL or something, you know, yeah. touch wood, but occasionally like know. that happens, then yeah. it's like really devastating for you because you yeah. got so close. Yeah. And then the recovery is so long. And then you don't know what you'll lose in that time either. So I, that's the thing that always scares me is like the thought of being injured like that, like a big one, like your knee or something like that. Do you that. have a good recovery process after fights? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a really good strength and conditioning coach who's also um, like a physio and he's really good at structuring my recovery as well. Um, I have like the perfect team. Like everything has come What are you together. doing? Like you're doing um, cryo, you're doing acupuncture? You... For recovery? Yeah. Um, no, nah, I, I do a lot of stretching Right. A lot of um, band work, mm -hmm. like resistance work to um, activate the right muscles. Yeah. Because um, a lot of injuries do come from the right, uh, the wrong, sorry, not the right muscles being activated before you train. So a lot of that. Um, and then just a lot of like, I like to swim. 
um, oh, really? massages. Yeah. Um, I have a physio if anything is like bothering me. Yeah. Um, but honestly, most of it is just dealt with before it even arises through the um, the band work and stretching mm. and then being proactive about yeah. the situation. Yeah. I have, yeah. Fantastic strength coach. He's all over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got it's, a niggle. I message him. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so important. It's so important because mm. it's, it's, it's your temple. It's your craft. It's, yeah. it's your mechanism that lets you do what you want to do. Mm. When you see something devastating, like ugh, there's so many injuries to draw off, but you know, like McGregor snapping his shin, for example, yeah. right. And you see you something like that. that and it's just like, damn, because you could tell the fighter was still there and him, he was still mm. ready to go. Mm but the body just couldn't keep up with mm. it. And so having, the, and you know, there's been a lot of back and forth about why that situation occurred. But um, one of the narratives that has come out is that, that like he was because of the calf kicks, which was so important in the second fight against Poirier, mm-hmm. um, he was hitting the heavy bag a lot, like just okay. low calf kicks on the heavy bag constantly over and over and over and over McGregor again. McGregor was? Yeah. Right. To, kind of condition yeah it's condition right. and to practice that lower calf kick which is a new element to the sport mm-hmm. and they think because of that there was a lot of micro fractures within his shin yeah and so i heard something about him already having some sort of fracture before the fight. yeah yeah and something like doesn't matter how good your strength coaches are and stuff though like i don't think you can plan for that sort of stuff Yes, but I also think that a good strength coach will kind of step in and say, like, mm. okay, we're we doing the right rehab work. Are you? How much are you actually exerting here? Mm. You know, like we have to be, you know, especially for a fighter of his magnitude, of such caliber, yeah, with all the resources that he has available. Mm. You know, like it's, that. yeah, yeah. If that is the case, then the accountability is on him. Yeah, it sucks because yeah. there's been a few of those nasty ones lately. Mm. Like the, um, the did you see the stomp? Did you see the leg stomp? Do I, I can't want to? remember who it was. I can't. Sian, remember. can you search up leg stomp UFC um, injury? I so think it was. It um, was it Khalil Roundtree? K H A L I L Khalil Round Roundtree. Am I searching up? Um, K H A L I L. K H I A L A L I L. A L I L N. Wait, A L. Um, maybe I don't know. Maybe just type UFC leg stomp. Uh, yeah. Um. So yeah, while well, he searches that up, yeah, it's you know having the right team of people around you, and mm. you know you could argue that a good head coach would have stepped in and said, "Hey, like you're hitting that heavy bag a bit too much. Like let's do something else." Mm. You know. Yeah, I don't know. It's tough. It's tough because mm. even though like I've had it as well, your coaches will step in and tell you to. Um, pull it down a bit, you know, you'll go home and go for a run. They won't know about <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> it's hard. You just want to perform so badly. You're addicted to your work, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, it looks like the second one. Looks or it could, yeah. Oh, is it that one? Yeah, play, but I can't is that the, watch is that. Is that a stomp? No, it's not the one I'm talking. But still. Oh. Uh. Apologies to everyone at home if you aren't good with this kind of stuff. I think you were right. I think it's the first one, but we'll watch this one. Nah, okay, that's a bad one too. But go to the first video. It's a leg stomp. So he stomps on the front of the knee and pops the knee backwards. This one? That was mean. If you're just listening, there was a lower like calf were, kick and you just see you, his shin snap, but he hasn't realized it yet. So as he steps back uh, onto the leg, he collapses. Is this a highlight video? Anyways, the point we're it's trying not the to one make I'm is... For. It's all right. It's anyway, all right, the point so. is some stuff you can't plan for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And because the nature of the sport is violence, the, yeah. eventually the output on your body is just going to... There it is. Number one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there. There we go. Oh, so is he's that a just dislocated used, knee? I don't know. He's just used the side of his leg and stomped on oh, the kneecap. Oh, no. Yeah. There were, like, so much talks about trying to make this move illegal after this fight. Yeah. I, I don't think they've made it. It's not illegal, but there's lots of controversy. Oh yeah, and I, yeah, it's as he stepped forward as well. So yeah, it's rough. Oh. 
nasty. <laughs> yeah. so bad. That's nasty. <laughs> you can take it off, bro. We're good. Yeah, we're good. That's the stuff <laughs> that nightmares are made of. Like, honestly, knock me out any day over doing that. <sighs> Fuck. Because the, he was pressed up against the cage. and He was he st- stepped into it, so he would have, like, doubled the amount of force. He stepped into it. And yeah. Then, fuck. Mm, nasty. Nasty. You forget the consequences. That's why that stuff's of, illegal in the gym. <laughs> yeah, that's you forget that the sport, you mm. know, the consequences are so high. Yeah. Um. So have you had, like, any moments in your career that you're specifically – kind of like oh wow i can't believe i did that like i feel like every fighter's kind of got like that one knockout that they landed or that one mm. leg kick that they're really proud of are there any that we could possibly pull up that you've got like mm, i do have a knockout on there mm-hmm. um, on your instagram uh yeah but it'd be like a while down that's okay oh i see that video with my hand in the air they all have your hands. <laughs> <laughs> See the one where my hand's being raised? Um, where in the oh, frame? No, it's not that one. Oh, it could be. Like, move. Oh, wait, top right, do you mean? Yeah. Play that top it right one. It could be that one. I, I don't have many knockouts, I only have three. Um, it's three more than me. Yeah, I wish there was more. More will come. More will come. More will come. Can we force um, So, this is my. Um, Muay Thai Pro did you? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so that was a body kick. Knockout. Sorry, Sian, can you just lower the volume? Yeah, it's very loud. Can you make it bigger? I can't make it bigger, it's in the game. Okay. I'll do it in post production then. Yeah. I think it's at the end. Yeah, that was like my proudest knockout, which is a body kick knockout. Nice spinning back fist. Wait, are there takedowns in Muay Thai? Uh, yeah, you just have to like stand back once you take them down. Right. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, mean body kick. And then I kind of like kept hitting her while she was on the ground, which kind of <laughs> like made me think maybe MMA is for me. Yeah. Um, but more so than like moments. Sorry, right, thank you, Annie. Yeah, more so than like knockouts or like moments in a fight it's m- meant more to me like some of the fights that i've won because i wasn't supposed to win them in any like there's no underdog no math. stories yeah the underdog story yeah if you look at everything on paper there's, i was not meant to win but those ones that like they they mean a lot to me like my boxing one she'd had 60 boxing fights and i'd had two um so <laughs> i just the whole camp i was like i don't see how i win the what math does not work when you got your hand raised um, it was really like overwhelming. Like I sort of like I remember not being able to like move for a second, um, because you're just like stunned and shocked that everything like your coaches told you was going to happen actually happened. Like I didn't believe in myself, but they believed in me, like for me. Um, so it's pretty cool when like that one moment, all the like emotion, you're like, oh, like I can do it. So every time that happens, it makes me believe just a little bit more that. Like, I can go where I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it's more those, yeah, underdog fights. Same with my pro MMA debut. She'd had 12 MMA fights and I'd had one. Um. And she was a brown belt too. So I just didn't see how I win. Like, it just doesn't make sense that I yeah. win. Um, but, yeah, the training MMA camps. MMA math is weird like yeah. that. Though. <clears throat> Everything is so unpredictable. Yeah. Like, you know. You put striker and jiu-jitsu artists and you think it's going to go one way, mm-hmm. but then it goes the other. Yeah. It's yeah, it's cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So just, yeah, it's more moments that get to me. Like the fire camp is so hard, like, and it's so emotional. And for me, it, like people assume that I'm like full of confidence and like think I'm going to win. But every fight camp, I'm convinced in my head that I'm losing. Really? Yes. It's like a... Uh, is that by yeah. design or is that just self-doubt? Mm, I think it's just because I always get uh, put with such quali- like high-quality opponents that I just see them as more experienced and at a like, better advantage than myself. Um, but, yeah, I'm just, I, I guess I'm starting to see it a little more each time. But especially, like, with the amount of work you do in fight camp, probably, like, for MMA, 50% of my training sessions don't go how I wish they went. So a lot of them, whether or not you underperform because you're tired or you just 
I don't know, you got caught by something you just really shouldn't have got caught by. Um, so that stuff will sink into your head. Like if that happened on the night, I'm gone. I remember from before the last MMA fight, I went to shoot him for a double leg and um, my opponent uh, went for a body kick. So I shot straight into the kneecap and split my face open. And I was like, if that was the fight, like that's it, done, over. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's what I think about. All the mistakes I make in training, um, if that happened on the night, you're gone. Um, for, thankfully it hasn't happened on the night yeah. and a fight is different to sparring. Jiu-jitsu is different to MMA. Well, uh, like, uh, as someone who's never been, had like a MMA fight, mm. how, how do they differ from sparring to an actual Well, fight? you're never um, – so all my sparring partners are trying to take me down. Because I've got so much striking experience and so little grappling experience. So they're all trying to take me down, probably as will my opponents for now until my grappling gets up to a higher level. Um, so you're inspiring. You're not hitting them at 100%, but they are grappling you at 100%. So it's very hard to get people to respect your striking if you can't hit them very hard. Whereas in an MMA fight, you've got this tiny little glove on, you're hitting, um, you're elbowing with a naked elbow like – you know, they're not going to, like, shoot in on you There's no shin when you're guards. kicking them in the it's, legs. Yeah. You know, it's very different. Yeah. People aren't scared of you inspiring. And people don't – I don't think, like, the common fan just respects that difference between an eight-ounce glove and a four-ounce mm. glove. They feel very – Very different. <laughs> very Very different. different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get a lot – you're rocked a lot easier than, than you think. Yeah, there's not. I mean, not that I was rocked, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's different. It is different. Definitely, it's different. It's a big wake up call. Yeah, it's a big wake up call. Yeah, I I remember the first time I got hit like with just MMA gloves on. Mm. And firstly, the thing is weird. I think we. I don't know if we spoke about this on air already, but the defense is so different because mm. you, the double hand up is. It's I don't just, remember it's if we on air off it. Yeah, me neither at this point. <laughs> but um. The defense is so much different. There's yeah. so much more room in which the glove can just seep mm -hmm. through your um your guard. And it's just because it's such little padding and you're essentially getting almost bare knuckle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very different. We were on air actually because we were watching the fight. Oh, okay, um, that's right. Yeah, our first MMA fight I got hit with this like little short right hand. And although it didn't hurt, I did like – uh, see a bit of a spin for a second mm. and I've never felt that in a like 23 kickboxing fights never felt that so the glove size is very significant changes the game a lot yes yeah. yes it's um it's a wild wild sport yeah <laughs> it's, it's crazy <laughs> it makes me wonder <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's too late to wonder you're in yeah. too deep now. I'm in too deep now I'm in too deep but there's nothing else I prefer to be doing mm. so all right, so we might start looking at wrapping this thing up. Yeah. Um, why don't you let people know where to find you? Mm -hmm. um, so Instagram is probably the best place, <clears throat> Jacinta underscore Jade, two E's. To be honest, I don't really use Facebook or anything too much. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the best place. Um, the gym page is Karyote MMA, so all the fight updates go on there How do you too. spell that? Um, C-A-R-I-O-T-I. -I. MMA underscore MMA. Hornsby underscore Hornsby. Yep. So all the updates go on there. Um, there's a lot of lot of good fighters to watch out of there as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, pretty um, much it for following. Big shout out to Phoenix Management as Phoenix well. Phoenix Management, yep. We've just like joined together recently, so good vibes there. Um yeah. Yeah. Everything's awesome. Uh, everything's coming together. Any fights coming up? Mm -hmm. Uh nothing locked in. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to Thailand in February. So oh, nice. Yeah, so when I come back, we'll lock something in. Just for holidays or are you uh, going to be training I'm going to be training. Yeah, of course you are. <laughs> yeah, I was going to just be holidaying, but then like this opportunity came up to spar with some of the girls there that are my size and are very experienced, very high level. So I, could, I couldn't say no. Of course. I'm already going to be there. And to spar against the tires, I mean. Yeah. 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 One of the girls that um hopefully I get some rounds in with has had like, like, so, like you know, when they're born into it, so many Muay Thai fights. Um, so I'm very interested. It would be a very good gauge for me to see where I'm at compared to um, like UFC fighters, like how much of um, a gap I have to bridge 
So I'm super, super keen. And then I'll come back and we'll book something. Awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. That'd be Should great. Be thank you for coming on. No worries. And guys, thank you for listening. That's it. Thank you.